My name is Heather Lau. I am the Executive Director of Global Clinical Development at Ultragenics. Prior to joining Ultragenics, I was uh, running the lysosomal program at NYU for many years. Uh, by training, I'm a board-certified pediatric neurologist with additional training in neurogenetics. So I have been diagnosing and managing patients with a variety of lysosomal storage disorders for many years. Coming to Ultragenics, which is a company that focuses on developing disease-modifying therapies for both rare and ultra-rare disorders. And one of these programs that we recently acquired in, back in 2022 was focusing on MPS3A, or mucopolysaccharidosis type 3A, also known as Sanfilippo syndrome. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So I will call it MPS3A, or Sanfilippo syndrome type A is one of the neuronopathic mucopolysaccharidoses. So what that means is that it primarily affects the brain function. There is some systemic manifestations as well. So the mucopolysaccharidoses as a collective are, are a group of enzyme deficiencies. In this particular case for Sanfilippo A, it is a uh, enzyme deficiency in sulfamidase which is a critical enzyme in the stepwise degradation of heparin sulfate. And so when we see that deficiency occur, it leads to accumulation of this toxic heparin sulfate molecule. Heparin sulfate is really critical to renal health in normal amounts. However, when it starts to accumulate, it leads to several downstream cellular derangements with eventual cell death, and that clinically manifests as neurodegeneration. So MPS3A is actually um, one of four subtypes of the Sanfilippo grouping. So MPS3A, B, C, and D um, are distinct enzyme deficiencies all involved with the heparin sulfate pathway. And I'm going to group them together because there are some similarities with the MPS3A subtypes. So typically there are different forms of it, meaning there's rapid progressor or more slow progressors. In our particular study, we looked at the rapid progressor form of MPS3A. The natural history of that disease is very important to understand. Even though the children are born with this enzyme deficiency and are accumulating heparin sulfate at a cellular level, they may not manifest clinically until after age two. So for the first couple of years of life, they might be not diagnosed because they are acquiring milestones. They're learning to walk and talk and um, felt they can feed. Um, and so they may not be picked up as a problem um, they might have some slow uh, acquisition of those milestones, so they might be categorized as global developmental delay. But it's not really until after 24 months that we start to see overt clinical symptoms. Unlike the other MPS disorders like MPS 1, 2, 4, 6, and 7, they don't have the, the classical facial features that might herald or indicate to a clinician that there's an MPS storage disease. Here they accumulate over time. So they will first appear to clinicians with uh, delays in cognition and language. Uh, they might have some features of autism. They might have behavioral issues, impulsivity, and sleep issues. So between 24 months and about 48 months, they are still uh, acquiring some skills. They're starting to slow, but now they're manifesting problems that are nonspecific. It's not until after you know, 36 to 48 months we start to see regression of skills. And that really brings uh, that patient and that family to a clinician's um, uh, office because they're losing skills. And now we're going from a concept of a delay to a neurodegenerative process. And so previously, we wouldn't see these patients and diagnose them until they're clearly losing skills. And, and sadly, in the rapid progressor form, um, the median age of death is around age 15. And so you can see that there's, um, this is a fatal neurodegenerative disease. Even in the slow progressor form, they might have a more protracted course, but ultimately there's early mortality. So early diagnosis is critical before there's irreversible brain damage, but until we have newborn screening, this has been very difficult. However, with the advent of uh, gene panels and whole exomes uh, being used for workups of developmental delay and autism, we are seeing some diagnosis of, of this disorder before regression. So 
you know, with an initial workup for developmental delay of autism, you'll do a chromosomal microarray, and you might do some other targeted testing. But there's now, um, a, a, you know, a creation of these developmental delay panels, and we're seeing they're putting MPS3A, B, C, and D on these panels. So fortunately, we're starting to pick it up sooner, but before that, they were picked up well into their degenerative phase. So UX111 is our uh, clinical program. Uh, UX111 is an IV, AAV gene replacement therapy. So it's administered intravenously. And the concept is that this um, vector of AAV9 vector it, it carries a human form of the sulfamidase transgene. And so it then crosses the blood-brain barrier and targets and gets picked up by a variety of brain cells. Those brain cells then start to express that protein, uh, that missing protein, the sulfamidase. Now, what's interesting with all of the lysosomal disorders is that it's not only about direct transduction of the cell, but we actually feel that cross-correction is an other way to ensure that we have broad distribution in the brain. So what do I mean by you know, cross-correction? So we know from IV um, enzyme replacement therapies that the cells can pick up enzyme. So a directly transduced cell can produce the protein and then it's secreted and picked up by neighboring cells. So we don't have to target every cell in the brain in order to feed many cells in the brain because they are either directly transduced or getting fed by their surrounding uh, neurons. And so that is the concept. So in UX111, it was studied initially in an open label dose escalation study. Uh, there were three doses at first. Cohorts one was 0 0.5 vector genomes per kg. Cohort two was one times uh, 10 to the 13 vector genomes per kg. And the final one, cohort three, was uh, a dose of three times 10 to the 13 vector genomes per kg. And so um, the study that we're looking at today, the results that we're reporting out, is on our cohort three patients. In cohort three, there was a subset that was uh, pre-specified. So we, we went and looked at a target population that was defined as age uh, two or under, or over two with a developmental quotient of 60 or above on the Bailey's three. That was the inclusion criteria. So out of the 22 patients in cohort three, 17 met that criteria. And that's our basis of our initial primary analysis. So as I said, the um, critical substrate that's accumulating in MPS3A is heparin sulfate. And the most appropriate matrix to measure a therapeutic response for this brain disease is looking at the cerebrospinal fluid levels of heparin sulfate. And here we're using a specific assay that detects the pathologic fragment that is specific, highly specific and sensitive to MPS3A. So we are looking at this, this biomarker. So CSFHS is our proposed biomarker. So in the initial data for all of cohort three, and then additional patients that were also dosed at the same registrational dose in another study, uh, we looked at that data together. And we show that within one month of administration of UX111, a rapid reduction in CSFHS. Now we first looked at the percent change from baseline, but, um, but then we looked at another type of analysis called exposure. And that we feel is more biologically relevant. So instead of just measuring the first and last values pre and post, we are now looking at all the values over time to see if there's a sustained reduction. So we showed a rapid reduction from percent change from baseline, but now we're showing sustained reduction using CSFHS exposure as measured by time normalized area under the curve. And in, so in the, all of those patients, 22 from cohort three in, in that one study and additional five patients in this other study, we show a, close to 64% reduction in CSFHS exposure that's sustained over time. And the longest follow-up is 77 months. Now the majority of the CSFHS levels were obtained in the first 24 months. Now if we look at the target population, that younger population, we also see approximately 66% reduction in those 17. So our conclusion is that ir irrespective of age or stage of disease, we are seeing a biochemical response to, it, uh, to our UX111 that's relevant because it's in the CSF space. And so our contention is that the CSFHS does represent a decrease in HS burden throughout the brain. And that we think this marker is a proximal disease activity marker 
uh, that is useful and should be used for accelerated approval. Well, we are also showing some emerging clinical data. The initial cohort three patients, that target population, we are already seeing some clinical benefit. So our first um, look was looking at the Bailey's three. Um, there's five domains, uh, cognition, expressive and receptive language, fine and gross motor. And then we compared it to a natural history cohort. So they were external comparator. For cognition, we start to see a clear separation between the two groups looking at 60 months of age. So when they're reaching five years old, we see as we compare the treated and our external comparator untreated, a clear separation. Children who were treated are continuing to make gains in their cognitive raw scores on the Baileys while the children that are untreated are losing. And we, still, we go on to show that again for both um, all four domains. There's not as much separation for gross motor because that's lost later in the disease, so we don't expect that. But we clearly see divergence in uh, cognition and uh, both forms of communication and emerging in fine motor. But from there, we go on to look at our model-based scores in, in the Bailey. From there, we looked at a, a, a model of this. So looking at, again, comparing natural history to treated, we see um, in the model-based mean scores of change over time from 24 to 60 months, a statistically significant difference between the treated and untreated. And the treatment effect is 22 points. So there's approximately 16 points of gaining in function in the treated at, while the untreated are declining by several points. And so what does that mean? Every time we gain in our cognitive scores, that child is gaining in a specific skill. And if they're losing, they're losing that skill. And so in a neurodegenerative disease, even stabiliz stabilization is a goal. But here, we're starting to show continued gains well into the period of the disease, the natural history of the disease, where we see degeneration. And so that's why we looked at 24 months and beyond. Because before 24 months, you really can't see a differentiation and treatment effect between the two groups. They're all gaining in skills. And then after 24 months, we start to see a separation. We go on to show not only statistically significant differences in cognition, but now this year we're showing that there is statistically significant differences in both receptive and expressive communication. Fine motor is approaching significance at a p-value of 0.05. And gross motor, like I said before, is not significantly different because both groups are not yet losing. The natural history are not losing just yet. So it was really critical to show that we already show clinical benefit in this group. Now what was important for us is then to connect the two concepts. So we have a reduction in our CSFHS uh, HS levels and we contend that that's predictive of later clinical benefit. It's an early marker to tell us that the therapy is working. And so next what we did was we looked at a correlation between the two. Is there a correlation between reduction in CSFHS exposure to improvement or stabilization in the Bailey's cognitive and, and then in receptive and expressive communication? And in fact, we do. We see a statistically significant correlation between the two. Uh, for cognition, for example, 15 of our 17 patients showed both a reduction greater than 50% in CSFHS exposure that correlated with improvement or stabilization in the estimated change in their scores over time. And so that was significant. We went on to look at all other four domains and they're also statistically significant. So in addition looking at the target population, we then decided to expand back to the older patients. It was really important for us to understand clinical benefit for children that were not all young at the time of intervention and clearly more advanced in their stage of disease at the time of administration. 10 patients met that criteria. This was a retrospective analysis. And what we did was we identified three functional areas that are clinically meaningful to parents and families and clinicians. So these areas were ambulation and mobility, communication, including nonverbal, and eating, self-feeding. And so even though patients who were received this drug later had already lost significant cognitive skills or already lost verbal communication, it was really important to see if there was differential benefit that was still meaningful. And in fact, we did. 
um, at the time of last uh, assessment, nine of our 10 patients are still walking. Eight are independent. And the age range is from five to almost 15. And just for comparison, typically we see loss of ambulation to wheelchair bound state around age 10. And so our, as our patients are being followed and approaching age 10, it's really important to see if they're retaining their ability to walk because the end stage of this disease is completely bed bound, non-communicative and G2 dependent. Um, our patients are also make, retaining their ability to eat orally and self feed in some cases. So in our patients, and then for communication, seven out of the 10 are still able to communicate non-verbally. Now there's limitations to this um, because it was a retrospective review of the item level data from both the Baileys and the Vineland. But this is our emerging um, evidence that there's clinical efficacy even when you intervene later in the stage of the disease. We uh, publicly disclosed that we submitted our BLA for UX111 for the treatment of pediatric patients with MPS3A. This was done at, in December of last year. And so now we're in a waiting period. The typical next steps is that it's now under review and in the hands of the FDA. And that's a several month process. And so uh, we can't be certain when, if and when we get approval because it's under review right now. So in, in the presentation um, here at World, we do show safety data for all patients treated with UX111. And so um, most of the treatment emergent adverse events were mild to moderate and related to elevations in liver enzymes that, most, um, that were um, transient and spontaneous re resolved in most and others required a little bit of a prolongation of steroids but they all returned back to baseline. For serious adverse events all but two were not related to UX111 and that, those two events occurred in the same patient and were related to mental status changes and uh, disease progression.